Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Back from Seattle here. Uh, I was in Seattle last week to see my granddaughter, and uh, everything is fine. So, uh, uh, good morning. And uh, I hear tomorrow that you're going to be celebrating Cinco de Mayo. You're going to have a little party for Cinco de Mayo, which is actually a beer holiday. That's what it was. And uh, my. Uh, uh, I have some interaction with Cinco de Mayo back in the late 1980s. I was doing a television show. I was trying to produce a television show. And I had uh, a saleswoman by the name of Kathy Taylor. And she was out of Chicago. And uh, she says, Corona Beer is kind of interested in sponsoring your show. I said, that's great. We could get a 13-week commitment. She said, no, only for two weeks. I said, what do you mean for two weeks? Well, they want to do something with this thing called Cinco de Mayo, and they want to sell beer, and they're going to be doing this uh, campaign across the United States to sell beer. I said, what is Cinco de Mayo? It's a beer holiday. That's what they want to create. So when tomorrow, when you actually have something for Cinco de Mayo, I understand you will, uh, it's all about beer. Cinco de Mayo and Corona Beer, it was people behind Corona Beer that uh, made you want to buy Corona Beer to celebrate Mexican heritage. In America, Cinco de Mayo has evolved into one of the country's largest drinking days. 2013, 11 years ago, $600 million worth of beer was sold in one day in the United States. Um, and that was according to uh, Nielsen Research, the dad people. It was more beer sold on that day that year than on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, or for the Super Bowl. But the American celebration of Cinco de Mayo has nothing to do with the Battle of Puebla, which was a minor battle in Mexico when the ragtag Mexican army executed an unlikely defeat of a far better equipped French force uh, at the Battle of Puebla on May 5th. 1862. But it's all about celebrating Mexico. It's all about beer. It's not about Mexican Independence Day. Uh, Cinco de Mayo is often mistaken for Mexican Independence Day, which is September 16th. On that day, 1810, Mexico declared its independence from Spanish rule. Cinco de Mayo is celebrated only sporadically in Mexico and only in one little area. Puebla, the southern town, and a couple of largest cities around there. This is Ensenada, Mexico. I have spoke on cruise ships. Ensenada is the first stop you go after L.A. And uh, Corona, Corona, another uh, beer uh, advertisement up there on the billboard. Uh, that's what you see in Ensenada. Uh, Cinco de Mayo gained first uh, popularity in the United States in the 1950s and 60s. The holidays... Uh, popularity grew in the 1960s when Mexican-American or Chicano uh, activists like Cesar Chavez embraced the holiday as a way to build pride among Mexican-Americans. Uh, again, Ensenada, when you get there, look at that big sign. Welcome to Ensenada, and it's about beer. See? It's all about beer. Welcome to Ensenada, uh, which is a place where Californians go surfing in Mexico. Uh, in the 1980s, this is roughly the time I dealt with uh, Kathy Taylor and Shell Bugan, who were doing advertising for me, uh, or the advertising sales for me, which never really amounted to anything. The commercialization of Cinco de Mayo started. The beer companies in the United States began a marketing campaign in the United States, and uh, Cinco de Mayo became a drinking holiday for many people in America. And I know you're getting some drinks tomorrow in celebration of Cinco de Mayo. The Independence Day is September 16th, although they start celebrating it on uh, September 15th at 11 o'clock at night. In the United States, Cinco de Mayo is widely interpreted as a celebration of Mexican culture and heritage, particularly in areas with substantial Mexican-American populations in California and in Texas. Partiers mark the occasion with parades and parties and mariachi music, Mexican folk dancing, and foods such as tacos. I bet you Taco Bell will be mobbed tomorrow. 
that's not real or authentic Mexican food, it's Taco Bell. And there is the flag uh, in uh, Mexico, and uh, Mexico uh, is a uh, independent state, uh, and has had rather interesting history with uh, the United States sharing the border. Mexico is more than the home of Cinco de Mayo. It's a country rich in history, tradition, and culture. Do you know that there are more museums in Mexico than any, in comparing them with other countries? There are more museums in Mexico than any other country. More museums in the United States, more museums in England, uh, in Mexico. Uh, Mexico is made up of 31 states in the federal district. It's the third largest country in Latin America, has one of the largest populations, more than 100 million people making um, it the home of more Spanish speakers than any other nation in the world. Evidence of past cultures and events are still apparent everywhere in Mexico. Many of Mexico's rural areas are still inhabited by indigenous people whose lifestyle quite similar. The lifestyles are quite similar to those of their ancestors. In addition, many pre-Columbian ruins still exist in Mexico like that, except that may be, instead of pre-Columbian, prefabricated. Uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of knockoffs out there now, and uh, they want you to believe that it's ruins, but it's really not. Uh, the main civilization, Mayan civilization, was one of the many civilizations that called the area, now known as Mexico, home. Uh, the Mayans were considered to be the pre-Columbian America's most brilliant civilization. And they lasted from about 250 to 900 AD, long before Columbus was born and discovered the New World. They developed a calendar, a writing system. They built cities that functioned as hubs for surrounding farming towns. Uh, religion played a central role in the Mayan life. And altars were carved with significant dates, histories, and elaborate human and divine figures. The um, Mayan civilization collapsed in the early 10th century, the 900s, likely due to overpopulation uh, and resulting damage to the ecological balance. Now, you might remember the uh, Mayan calendar from about 11 and a half years ago and how the Mayan calendar just ran out on December 21st, 2012, and we were all going to die. The world was going to come to an end. Uh, the Mayan calendar is a dating system that was used by civilization, uh, its civilization. It served as the basis for all other calendars used in ancient and Central American uh, and Mexican civilizations. Uh, the calendar was based on a ritual cycle of 260 named days, 52 weeks, five days a week, then you have the weekends, and a year of 365 days. Consecutive years were then considered to form a larger cycle of 18,980 days, or 52 years of 365 days. I guess they didn't count leap year. The longer cycle was called the calendar round, December 21st, 2012 end of the calendar. Some people said it's the end of the world. First day of summer in the southern hemisphere. First day of winter in the northern hemisphere. The world's coming to an end. It didn't. We're here 11 and a half years later to talk about it. Then there was the Aztec civilization, another one of Mexico's uh, major civilizations. It was the last of the pre-Columbian Mexico, uh, or last of the pre-Columbian Mexico's great native civilizations, rose to uh, prominence in the central valleys of uh, Mexico around 1427, which was, what, about uh, 65 years before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Remember, Columbus found North America? And they partnered with the uh, Toltecs and what was left of the Mayans. Triple Alliance conquered smaller cultures to the east and west until the Aztec Empire spanned Mexico from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf Coast. At the height of uh, their reign, uh, the Aztecs had about 5 million people in their tightly controlled uh, system of self-supporting units called uh, Capulla. Uh, each unit had its own governing council, schools, army, temple, land, uh, but paid tribute to the supreme leader of the empire. 
Uh, influenced by earlier Mexican civilizations, the Aztecs conducted extraordinarily uh, large religious ceremonies that featured dances, processions, and uh, hey, Jose, come in. Come here, Jose. You're going to be our sacrifice. You have to sacrifice somebody. Don't worry about it. Your kids will be taken care of, and you're going to go to a better place, and we got somebody to, to replace you for your wife. Don't worry about it. You're our sacrifice. Yeah, there were human sacrifices. They founded what is now Mexico's capital city, Mexico City. But uh, their collapse was swift, really swift. Uh, it fell rather quickly. The catalyst for the empire's collapse was the arrival of the Spaniards in uh, Mesoamerica. The first Spaniards arrived in 1517. All it took was three ships and about 100 men to conquer 5 million people. Uh, in 19, rather 1519, a small Spanish army led by a minor nobleman. Wait, if you're a nobleman, you're not minor. What's this guy? Just, hey, you're over there in the court, you're just minor. Anyway, uh, Hernando uh, Cortes uh, invaded Mexico, claimed it for the Spanish crown. He quickly formed alliances with the non-Aztec indigenous, uh, indigenous elites, uh, hostile to Aztec domination, and by 1521, it took all four years, the Spanish and their local allies captured and utterly destroyed the Aztec Empire's major cities, including the capital, which would become Mexico City. New Spain, there's Cortes. Uh, the Aztec land was incorporated into the Spanish Empire, and Christianity was brutally enforced. Remember, this is the time of the Inquisition. What a show. Virtually all remaining Aztec books, especially religious ones, were burned. They were burning and banning books back in 1521, which must have been a novel idea because the printing press had just been invented by Gutenberg. Um, so anyway, they're burning the books, and people who were hiding the books were in danger, and they risked being arrested for witchcraft. Sounds like the Salem witch trials up in New England, right? Well, this is a little earlier, and they were burned at the stake by the Inquisition. By 1574, Spain controlled a large portion of the Aztec Empire, enslaved most of the indigenous population. They brought diseases into society, and the Spaniards devastated the indigenous population of uh, Nueve Espana, or New Spain. They killed an estimated 24 million people between 1521 and 1605. Concerned about the Catholic Church's ever-growing power, King Carlos III of Spain expelled the Jesuits from uh, Nueve Espana in the late 1700s. Francis Napoleon Bonaparte, he had an occupation of Spain in 1808, and that completely ruined New Spain, or, or what would become Mexico, uh, the Spanish grip on uh, Nube Espana was weakened. This is the Ben Franklin, George Washington, Patrick Henry, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Samuel Adams of Mexico. He's a priest by the name of Hidalgo, uh, Miguel Hidalgo y Castilla, and he is considered the father of Mexico. Mexico's Independence Day commemorated on September 16th. That's the anniversary of the revolutionary priest, uh, Hidalgo, and his cry of Dolores, a call to arms that amounted to a declaration of war against the Spanish colonial government on that day in 1810. Uh, in response, rebel leader Vicente Guerrero and defected royalist general Agustin de Iturbe uh, collaborated to gain Mexico's independence from Spain in 1821. They drafted the Mexican, Mexican Constitution. So what happened to this guy, Hidalgo? Well, unlike the ones from 1776 who signed the Declaration of Independence and went hiding after July 2nd, just picked July 4th to announce the Declaration of Independence, this guy didn't go hiding, and the Spaniards were after him. Um, he started the insurgency in 1811. He was executed shortly after he was captured by the Spanish. By 1820, Mexico is on the verge of independence. The Mexican War of Independence was not a single event or a coherent event, but a lot of local and regional struggles. 
that occurred within the same time period. It culminated with the drafting of the Declaration of Independence of the Mexican Empire at Mexico City, September 28, 1821, following the collapse of the Spanish royal government. But you need an emperor, right? So this guy becomes the emperor, uh, uh, Augustine I. But uh, he wasn't Augustine I, he was Er Tubedi. After the Treaty of uh, Cordoba gave Mexico its independence, he enters Mexico City uh, September 1821, and on May 22nd, he's proclaimed Augustine I, Emperor of Mexico. He's the one who said, I'm it. There were a lot of people who didn't like him. In December 1822, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana led a revolt against him. Uh, on January 4th, 1823, Augustine I signed the first permit for settlement of Anglo-Americans uh, Anglo in Texas, Stephen F. Austin Colony. The Americans are coming. And this guy isn't too happy, Santa Ana, that the Americans are coming. Uh, he overthrew uh, Augustine I, drew up a new constitution, established the Federal Mexican Republic, 19 states and four territories, and his job now is basically to keep Texas in Mexico. Uh, from 1823 to 1836, he was the president of Mexico, uh, squelched uh, Texas stand for independence in the Battle of the Alamo during his last year in office. And it's time to say goodbye to Augustine I. He wasn't around very long. Uh, he f basically abdicates on uh, March 19, 1823. He flees by May 11th, goes to Italy. But um, the new guy, Santa Ana, doesn't do anything about Stephen F. Austin settling in Texas with the Americans. Um, that continues. Things did not end well for Augustine I. He was unaware of a death, uh, decree of death awaiting his reappearance in Mexico, and he sails from Europe. Starting on May 11, 1824, and he lands in Mexico at uh, Sada La Marina on July 15th. Hey, isn't that Augustine? Yeah. Hey, let's kill him. He was recognized. He was captured. He was shot Padilla on July 19th. Should have stayed in Italy. Should have stayed in Italy. But it ain't over until it's over. Despite the creation of the Mexican nation. The Spanish still managed to hold on to a port in Veracruz that Mexico could not get control of until November 23rd, 1825. Spanish attempts to re-establish control of Mexico culminated in the 1829 Battle of Tampico, during which Spanish invasion force surrounded, uh, was surrounded in uh, Tampico and was forced to surrender. Well, what's going on in Washington? They're keeping a close eye on what's going on in Mexico. After all, that's the southern border. Actually, it was also the western border. And it went all the way up into what is now Utah. It's a huge piece of land, a really huge piece of land. The United States was basically east of the Mississippi at this point, down to the Gulf of Mexico. James Monroe was the president of the United States in 1823. Uh, Monroe invoked manifest destiny, meaning that this land is my land and your land is my land in North America. Uh, when he spoke before Congress, Monroe uh, warned European nations not to interfere with America's westward expansion, threatening any attempt by Europeans to colonize the American continents, North and South America, would be seen as an act of war. Uh, this policy of American sphere of influence and not intervention in European affairs became known as the Monroe Doctrine. Mexican is, Mexico is about ready to become independent. Uh, in a bid to promote development, in 1823, the new Mexican government, free of Spain, encouraged American immigrants, come on American immigrants, come to Mexico, come on, uh, to settle in the north northernmost part of the province of Texas in the 1820s. And Mexico would soon regret this. Very soon regret this. What have we done? Why do we need these people? American settlers arrived in alarming numbers, 20,000 of them by the end of the decade, and show we don't need no stinking 
Mexican citizenship, we don't need no stinking badges. They show no inclination to either assimilate themselves to Mexican culture or actually obey Mexican laws banning slavery. We're going to do what we're going to do. This is the map. And that is Mexico. Down there goes all the way up into Utah, goes into California, uh, and New Mexico, and Arizona, and Colorado. It is a huge, huge, huge slice of territory. So John Quincy Adams is president of the United States in 1827, and uh, he sees what's going on in this breakaway province of Texas, and he says to the Mexican government, we'll buy it from you. Here's a million dollars, $41 million today. Uh, but the minister, Joel Ponce, the American minister, said, I'm not going to listen to J.Q. Adams. His reasoning? Mexico is certain to reject the offer, and he did not want to anger the Mexicans. On August 25th, 1829, President Andrew Jackson offered to buy Texas from Mexico. Jackson's bid was wrapped up in slavery-related politics, and here is the problem. Uh, as states are coming into the United States because of the Missouri Compromise of 1820, one had to be a free state, one had to be a slave state. Uh, there were an increasing numbers of slaves, uh, non-slave states entering the Union, and Southerners were lobbying Jackson to add Texas as a slave state. We needed it as a slave state. Cries for re-annexation of Texas. Kind of odd. America never had Texas. It wasn't ever part of the uh, Louisiana Purchase. Uh, it was a separate entity oh, run by Spain and now an independent country, Mexico. Uh, in 1830, the Mexican government passed a law. No more U.S. immigration into Texas. Why don't we build a wall to keep the Americans out? Why don't we build a wall? Well, they never did build a wall. And as far as suspending immigration, it didn't work. In 1835, the North Americanos rose in revolt. And after the bloody defeat at uh, the Alamo in March 1836, they won a resounding victory over the Mexican general Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana at San Jacinto on April 21st, 1836. The Texans said, we're a country now. We're a country, we've broken away, and the Mexican government said, not so fast. You're just a rebellious uh, colony or uh, province. They could have had Fort Worth. I could have been writing that bull in Fort Worth. If you take a look, I am wearing a sport coat, I am wearing a tie, a dress shirt, dress pants, dress shoes. We went down to uh, the stockyards in uh, uh, Fort Worth. And that guy over there said to me, come on, big boy, you a Yankee? I said, yeah, from New York. He said, get on the ball. And I got on the ball, and I rode the ball for a few minutes. I survived. That could have been Mexico. Instead, it was Texas. After Texas won its independence, Jackson decided not to press for annexation, despite his close friendship with the Texas president, Sam Houston, because he feared the backlash in the North if he created a new slave state. On March the 4th, 1837, Jackson's final day in office, he recognized the independent state of Texas. The Republican of uh, Republic of Texas became a sovereign state on March 2nd, 1836, although Mexico said, no, nah, you're still part of us, you're still part of us. Your tax dollars at work. That's your tax dollars at work. I was uh, at uh, the George Bush Presidential Library State Department job where I had to speak to foreign nationals from, um, three foreign nationals from uh, uh, Nigeria, three from Indonesia, three from Venezuela, three Russians, and three Turks. Uh, there were 20 students in the class and the government chose me to talk about how sports and politics interacts in the United States. Would you send me as a government representative? No. No? You wouldn't send me, but you paid for me. They had to vet me, actually, but they really didn't have to vet me because I had a Secret Service credential in 1979, as early as 1979. So they probably know I'm speaking to you today. Uh, they probably have been following me, but uh, there were also four Americans. 
Uh, the Republic of Texas. Texas has had an interesting, uh, uh, interesting history. It's part of Spain. It's part of France. Part of Mexico. It was own republic. It entered the United States in 1845, part of the Confederate States of America. Anybody ever go to Six Flags uh, Amusement Park? I think so. Do you know where six, the Six Flags comes from? It started in an amusement park that started in Texas. And they said, yeah, Six Flags. Why don't we call ourselves Six Flags? Even though they're in New Jersey now, among other places. So that's the Republic of Texas, and you can see it. There's parts of New Mexico and Oklahoma and uh, Kansas and um, up there is uh, Colorado into Wyoming. It went far north as Wyoming. And it was a big, 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 big area. Uh, in 1836, there were more Anglo, uh, Anglo settlers in Texas than Hispanics and Texas leaders sought to join the United States. But uh, Old Hickory said, no, no, now is not the time. Andrew Jackson said, no. His successor, Martin Van Buren, also said, no. Uh, why? They didn't want to go to war with Mexico. And there was opposition from Americans in the North who thought that if Texas was coming in, it was coming in as a slave state and that would expand slavery, and they didn't want it. Jackson had no congressional annexation support during his term, which ended on March 4th, 1837. Martin Van Buren, his successor, refrained from annexing Texas after the Americans threatened war. It's President John Tyler. He's president 1841 to 1845. Do you know he still has a grandson that's alive? He's president 180 years ago. He has a grandson that is alive today. And how that happened was he had a child in his 70s, and that child had a child in his 70s, and um, that kid is still alive. In fact, he had two grandkids uh, that were still alive up to a couple years ago. There's one still around. That guy, who's the grandkid, is linked to this guy who was president in 1841 and 42, and 1843 and 44, 45. Anyway, uh, John Tyler became the president following the death of William Henry Harrison, 31 days after Harrison was inaugurated on March 4th, 1841. And his agenda included, let's annex the Republic of Texas. But he had no support. 1844, after Tyler's break with the Whigs in 1841, he attempted to return to his own Democratic Party, but its members, especially the followers of Van Buren, were not ready to accept them. Now, there's a problem in the Pacific Northwest, the United States, and Britain are running the Oregon Territory, and there have been all kinds of border disputes that uh, the United States has been going through with Britain. The most serious was in 1839, when uh, nobody knew where the uh, British North American Territory of New Brunswick ended and where Maine began. It was at a river. That's where they should have settled. But in 1839, Congress decided, you know what? We want to go to war again with Britain. And uh, Maine had all these troops ready to go. And the Brits brought all their troops down from Quebec City and Quebec. And they're at the border. And it would, would have become the War of Aroostock, except uh, the general, Winfred Scott, from the United States, somehow stepped in and convinced both sides, you really don't want to do another war, your third war. But both sides were ready to go. And it was settled for a little while, uh, but there were still some problems. That's Bar Harbor, Maine, by the way. Tyler considered, uh, or rather continued, his predecessor's expansion policies in the Northwest into the Oregon Territory. He uh, pushed for a chain of forts from Council Bluffs, Iowa, to the Pacific, but was unable to conclude the treaty um, with, to fix the Oregon uh, boundaries. Tyler also wanted the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, in 1842, the Webster-Ashburton Treaty was negotiated by U.S. Secretary of State Daniel Webster that settled the feud with England over Maine and where Maine and British North America actually began, Canada, eventually. Uh, war had narrowly been averted between the two nations on several occasions over border incursions, and the treaty was instrumental in bettering diplomatic relationships, but it was only a temporary solution. 
That is actually a picture of Martin Van Buren uh, back in the 1840s. Uh, in 1844, Van Buren's position of not annexing Texas through the nomination to James Polk. Polk was Andrew Jackson's protege. And by 1844, Andrew Jackson was in support of adding Texas to the United States. And that is a picture of James Polk. Uh, who's James Polk? The Whigs jeered. Democrats replied, Polk was the candidate who stood for expansion. He linked the Texas issue, popular in the South, with the Oregon question, attractive to the North. And Polk, he also wanted to get California. Uh, the 1844 election shapes America permanently. Uh, James Polk is the winner. Uh, he defeats the Whig, Henry Clay. Uh, the incumbent John Tyler entered in 1844, and he wanted to run for another term. Uh, however, he had been expelled from the Whig Party in 1841. He had no party. He was on the outside looking in. The Whigs chose Henry Clay, who had run for president, uh, as the National Republican in 1832, he was against annexation. Democrats split over a number of issues, among them the annexation and the use of hard money over paper. Uh, Martin Van Buren wanted coins. He didn't want paper, which was perceived as anti-business. But he also seemed to be the likely candidate. Pope, he was angling to become vice president. But he emerged as a Democratic nominee with the former minister to Russia and Pennsylvania, George Mifflin Dallas, as his running mate. Polk was the first dark horse candidate uh, for president. Uh, Polk and Clay were slave owners. Neither one of them wanted to talk about the slavery issue. But it arose because there was a party that was emerging called the Liberty Party. It's an anti-slavery party, and they nominated James Gillespie Burney as the presidential candidate. Polk brushed off the slavery issue, saying, let the states handle it. Shouldn't be me. Shouldn't be the federal government. Uh, Clay was portrayed as a flip-flopper. Imagine that, a flip-flopper in 1844. Polk won the election. He's given a big gift by Tyler on March 1st, 1845. He gets Texas, and that's me and my son. Uh, school Book Depository Building in Dallas, where Lee Harvey Oswald shot John F. Kennedy. Anybody been there? Yeah? It is really close. 200 feet. That's it. 200 feet. The rifle shot went 200 feet. And uh, there's the sixth floor depository, and this is where Kennedy would have been, right over there. 200 feet. Uh, in 1844, Tyler resumed negotiations with the Republic of Texas. His uh, efforts culminated on April 12th in the Treaty of Annexation, an event which caused Mexico to sever diplomatic relations with the United States. Maybe war coming. Tyler lacked the votes in the Senate to ratify the treaty, defeated by a wide margin in June. Shortly before he left office, Tyler tried again this time through a joint resolution of both houses of Congress with the support of the president-elect, James Pope, Tyler managed to get the joint resolution passed on March 1st, 1845, signed it the next day. President Pope has a big gift. He has Texas. And there is President Pope. Uh, James Pope said he's only running for one term, and he only had four goals for his administration. Uh, he favored lowering tariff uh, rates to help the southern states economically. That happened in 1846. He wanted to establish an independent treasury. That was done in 1845. He wanted to settle the Oregon border question with Great Britain, which he had to do or face another war in 1846, and acquire California. Well, he's got Texas. While Mexico did not follow through with its threat to declare war, the United States annexed Texas. Relations between the two countries remain tense due to Mexico's disputed border with Texas. According to the Texans, their state included significant portions of what now is today's New Mexico and Colorado and western portions of Texas itself. They claimed, we went to the Rio Grande River. The Mexicans said, no, 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 it's the Nueces River north of the Rio Grande. And there is Texas large state. 
In July 1845, Pope ordered the commander of the U.S. Army in Texas, General Zachary Taylor, move his troops into the disputed lands between the two rivers. In November 1845, Pope dispatched Congressman John Slidell to Mexico with the instructions to purchase uh, the disputed areas along the Texas-Mexico border and also that area uh, where New Mexico and California would be, the new states eventually. Texas becomes the 28th state admitted to the Union. That's December 29th, 1845. Acquisition of Texas, or rather California, proved more difficult. Pope sent an envoy to Mexico. Here's $20 million, $822 million in today's money, plus a settlement of damage claims owed to Americans in return from California and New Mexico. Ain't happening. Because there's no, no leader of any country that's willing to give up half of this country. And the United States basically is telling the Mexican government, give up half the country to us. There's just no way that was going to happen. The envoy, Slidell, get out of here. Uh, in May 1846, Polk is becoming very impatient. And he hears that there's some skirmishes inside that disputed territory. And he decides it's time to go to war. After all, he's fixed up the, somewhat fixed up the border issue uh, with Britain and Oregon, so he doesn't have to worry about a war up there. Mm -hmm. On May 13, 1846, the United States declared war on Mexico. Tijuana, gas station in Tijuana. Following the capture of Mexico City in September 1847, Nicholas Trist the chief clerk of the Department of State, and Polk's peace emissary uh, began negotiations for a peace treaty with the Mexican government under terms similar to those pursued by Slidell the previous year. Polk soon grew concerned that uh, by Trist's conduct, uh, he didn't think that he was pushing him hard enough or the Mexicans hard enough. And also Trist was a close friend of General Winfred Scott, who was thought to be a strong contender for the Whigs' presidential uh, nomination in 1848. Uh, and the war actually encouraged expansionist Democrats to call for a complete annexation of Mexico. Pope, uh, rather Pope, uh, recalled Trist in 1847. Looks like one of the Smith brother cough drops guys, doesn't it? Uh, believing that he was on the cusp of an agreement with the Mexicans, Trist ignored Pope, came back, said, here's the Treaty of Guadalupe, Hidalgo, take it. And Pope did, February 2nd, 1848. Under the terms of the treaty, Mexico did give up 525,000 square acres, or 55% of its pre-war territory, in exchange for $15 million, $514 million in today's money, uh, in assumption by the US government of up to $3.25 million, $126 million today, worth of debts owed to Mexico by U.S. citizens. Pope would have preferred a more extensive annexation of Mexico. He wanted to go all the way down to Colombia and Panama. Uh, but that he realized, you know what? It's going to be disastrous. I don't want to be Lyndon Johnson. Oh, he wouldn't come until later. And decided to submit the treaty to the Senate for ratification. Uh, there was some, some opposition, but the Senate said 38-14, let's pass it, and that was that. Except Polk had another opportunity for a second dip at Mexico. That's Cozumel, I've spoken on cruise ships, that one in particular. And uh, if you get out of uh, New Orleans or you get out of Galveston, Texas, the first stop you generally make on the cruise ship port tour is Cozumel uh, in the Yucatan. Uh, following the 1848 treaty, Pope sought to send troops to the Yucatan where there was a civil war between secessionists uh, supporting the Mexican government uh, and the ones against it. Uh, uh, the U.S. Congress said, we've had enough war. We're out of there. The Mexican war was supposed to be short, nearly bloodless. It was neither. And Congress said, that's it. We're done. We're absolutely done. We don't want to do this anymore. So Pope had to take what he got. Mexico loses, cedes its claims to Texaco. The Rio Grande border was accepted by both nations in 1848. My friend Jeff Beeren and me, San Francisco Wharf. How many of you been to San Francisco? Go eat at the wharf? 
Yeah, I guarantee you didn't go eat at Applebee's. That's Applebee's. We go over that way to uh, Aliodo's uh, Fish House. We always go to Aliodo's. Jeff lives out there, a good friend of mine for 40 years. And uh, hey, let's go to Aliodo's. Yeah, that sounds good. And we do. Uh, now, California, there's a revolt. And California is a republic for 25 days. Uh, on June 14, 1846, a ragtag group of about 30 gun-toting Americans enter Simona, a small town in the Mexican territory of Alta California, or High California. And I was telling this, uh, doing this talk yesterday, and everybody except one person was in disbelief hearing this story. I'll tell you that in a second. Prepared to take the town by force, they instead sat down for a branding with Colonel Mariano Vallejo of the Mexican Army. They got him drunk. He gave up the California territory. These people were saying, what? And there was a guy who took a history class in college. And he said, yeah, that's what happened. I couldn't believe it. The guy got drunk and gave up California. That's what he did. For the next 25 days, California was an independent nation, the California Republic, and then joined the United States as a territory. Two days later, the Bear Flag Revolt officially ended as California is absorbed into the Union. The Californios were formally ceded out to California or High California, San Francisco, San Diego, Sacramento, Los Angeles, Hollywood. Could have all been Mexican, except for a bottle of brandy, or a few bottles of brandy and the drunk colonel, uh, and it was the Treaty of uh, Cahunga. Pope made no secret of his desire to annex California. California, here I come, right back where I started from. Well, that's not the Golden Gate Bridge, it's the Bay Area Bridge, but Jolson was singing about the Golden Gate Bridge. Open up, open up that Golden Gate, California, here I come. All for brandy. February 1848, Mexico ceded New Mexico and California in return for $15 million. $593 million today in the assumption of damaged claims. This is what Brandy got for the United States. All that territory. They got Vallejo drunk, and he gave up all that territory. All of it to the English border. Uh, on uh, January 24, 1848, gold had been discovered on the American River in Sacramento. Can you imagine the Mexicans hearing that in Sacramento, there was uh, near Sacramento, they found gold, and we gave that place up for a bottle of brandy? Uh, and the ensuing gold rush hastened California's admittance to the Union. With the gold rush came a huge increase in population and a pressing need for civil government. Now, my kids decided they wanted to pan for gold uh, in the mid-1990s. Uh, they never found any. It cost me three bucks because I had to get a pan for my son, my daughter, and my wife. And they're doing that and nothing, absolutely nothing. But there are gold in them there hills. On December 5th, 1848, President James K. Polk ignites the California gold rush with an address to Congress. There were rumors about gold being found in California, but California's disputed status during uh, American, Mexican American War and the lack of direct means of communications left an air of disbelief around the incredible tales of wealth in the hills. Uh, he's found gold in my pockets. I help him and my daughter. So I guess they did found gold, but I didn't find any in that river or those hills. Uh, accounts of abundance of gold are of such of an extraordinary character as they would scarcely command belief. The expirations already made warrant that the supply is very large and that the gold is found at various places in an extensive district of the country. James K. Polk, President of the United States. Oh, the 49ers. That's the wrong 49ers. I was covering football in those days. San Francisco 49ers. Oh, the real 49ers. Close to 100,000 people went from <laughs> California, uh, or to California, from the United States and Europe and every other corner of the globe. Globe seekers from Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, China, sailed across established uh, trade routes across the Pacific. But if you lived here in New York, here in Roslyn, you would have a very, very tough time getting over to California. Uh, she is not 49er, she's my wife. 
uh, and probably once have been a 49er. Uh, a voyage from the East Coast to California around Cape Horn was about 17,000 miles long. It could take five months. Oh, there was a shorter alternative if you like yellow fever. If you want to risk yellow fever, you can get yellow fever. Uh, crossing the Isthmus by foot, Columbia's Panama, uh, or on horseback, getting bitten up by mosquitoes that carry yellow fever, and then catching a boat sailing from, uh, uh, from the uh, Central American Pacific Coast of California. Except until 1850, there were no regular steam trip travel in the Pacific, and passengers might find themselves stranded in Panama, risking getting yellow fever, for uh, weeks or months waiting for a ship to California. Now, not everybody who went to California was there to use a pickaxe and uh, a pen. This guy, how many of you ever wore Levi's? Levi's. This is Levi Strauss. He ain't no fool. He's not going to break his back, uh, you know, with a pickaxe looking for gold. Mm -hmm. He's going to make pants for people. And that's what he did. He made Levi's jeans. Not everyone who came to California during the gold rush uh, planned to earn a fortune by using a pen or a pickaxe in the gold fields. Many uh, enterprising young men and women, like Levi Strauss, realized there was just as much money to be made by providing gold, uh, the gold miners uh, with goods and services. The ensuing gold rush transformed California from a region sparsely populated with Hispanics and Native Americans to a bustling economic center controlled by white Americans. California entered the United States as the 31st state on September 9th, 1850. Well, Mexico settles down. They have a lot less land. The United States, well, they continue their westward voyage. Benito Juarez was the president of Mexico in the 1860s. And the Monroe Doctrine became American policy, and it remains American policy to this day 200 years later, except during the 1860s, when the Civil War broke out. 1861, Benito Juarez was elected president of Mexico. At the time, Mexico was in financial ruin after years of internal strife, and Juarez was forced to default on debt payments to European governments. France, Britain, and Spain. Well, they sent naval forces to Veracruz, Mexico, saying, we want our money now. Well, Britain and Spain negotiated a deal with Juarez. They withdrew their forces. But this guy, Napoleon III, said, no, 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 no. We're going to invade. We want the land. Uh, so he's going to try to carve out an empire in the Mexican territory. Late 1861, a well-armed French fleet stormed Veracruz, landing a large force of troops driving President Juarez and his government into retreat. That's, so we finally get to Cinco de Mayo. We are finally here. It took all of that rambling to get to Cinco de Mayo, but we are here. 6,000 French troops under General Charles Latrell de Lorenz set out to attack Pueblo de Los Angeles, a small town in east central Mexico. In the north, Juarez uh, rounded up a ragtag force of about 2,000 loyal men sent them to Pueblo. And here's the battle. And it took place on one day, the Battle of Pueblo. The battle lasted from daybreak to early evening. When the French finally retreated, they had lost nearly 500 soldiers. Fewer than 100 Mexicans had been killed in the clash. So it's time to relax and get a corona in celebration of Cinco de Mayo. Let's get a corona. Well, it's not that simple. The war would continue, but the success of the Battle of Puebla on May 5th, 1862, represented a great symbolic victory and bolstered the resistance movement. Meanwhile, mothers, don't let your kids grow up to be the Archduke of Austria. It's, it's not going to end well for you, whether it's this guy or one of his heirs in 1914. Anyway, this is Maximilian, Archduke of Austria. 1863, Napoleon invaded uh, or invited Maximilian, Archduke of Austria, to become the Emperor of Mexico. And he accepts the offer. Although Maximilian's conservative government controlled most of the country, 
Liberals held on to power in northwestern Mexico and parts of the Pacific Coast. And in the United States, there was a lot of concern. But there's not really all that much the United States could do. This is William Henry Seward. Anybody go to Seward High School in lower Manhattan here? Ever hear of Seward High School? Do you know who the most famous alum of Seward High School is? Bernie Schwartz. Do you know who Bernie Schwartz is? Tony Curtis. He went to Seward High School, as did my mother. Anyway, he's the Secretary of State. And uh, he issued a statement, we don't like what's going on, but they couldn't kick in the Monroe Doctrine because there was the American Civil War. And Seward and the American President, Abraham Lincoln, didn't want to antagonize Napoleon III, risk his intervention on the side of the Confederacy. So they said, you know what, let it go. Don't worry about it. Maybe we'll come back eventually and enforce it. The end of the American Civil War is in 1865. It uh, coincided with the beginnings of success for Juarez forces against Maximilians. Uh, on January 31st, 1866, Napoleon III ordered the withdrawal of French troops to be conducted in three stages from November 1866 to November 1867. France finally withdraws in 1867. But doesn't end very well for Maximilian. Nope, told you. Mamas, don't let your uh, sons grow up to be Archdukes of Austria. Uh, he's captured in May 1867, sentenced to death at a court martial, executed along with the generals, uh, Miguel Miriamon and Thomas Mejia, on June 19, 1867. So let's have a beer. Let's have a beer, except you can't have a beer and celebrate Cinco de Mayo where I am in Nogales, Mexico. Now behind me is Nogales in Arizona. That's where you can celebrate, because that's where they celebrate Cinco de Mayo, in Arizona, not in Nogales, Mexico. In 1989, the San Antonio, Texas-based Gambrinus Group who is the regional importers of Corona and Grupo Modelo, uh, launched a Cinco de Mayo theme ad encouraging Mexican Americans, already celebrating the holiday, to make it a priority on this day to drink Mexican beer. The campaign took off. By 1996, consuming Corona as a way to celebrate Cinco de Mayo was the core way most people acknowledged the holiday's existence, a huge victory for Corona marketers. That same year, the marketing company's manager, Don Mann, said, Corona is the first thing that comes to mind when customers think of Cinco de Mayo. It worked. It worked. Cozumel. Well, they don't celebrate in Cozumel, except the tourists do. They will tomorrow. As the holiday has grown in popularity, its connection to the original meaning has continued to weaken, while it's an excuse to party, has drastically increased. Much of this uh, had to do not only with beer marketing company, but others, like tequila. Uh, but other beer and alcohol companies weren't going to miss out on this opportunity, uh, particularly tequila brands, which latched on to the same themes of Mexican pride that the Corona ads did. Today, Americans consume more beer on Cinco de Mayo than any other holiday, uh, paired with more than 100 million liters of tequila. Now, if you do go to Casa Bell, you see Taco Bell, you see McDonald's, you see all these other places. So the local places put up an advertisement, authentic Mexican food. Oh, sponsored by Corona Beer. Corona Beer. Now, meanwhile, in Mexico, just another day. Cinco de Mayo is marked in the state of Puebla with historic reenactments in Battle of Puebla, parades, mariachi music, colorful costumes, and fireworks. But for most Mexicans, 95% of the Mexicans, May 5th, or Cinco de Mayo, is a day like any other. Uh, this is uh, Chipias. Uh, that's, uh, again, a monument to Hidalgo. Uh, September 15th is a celebration. Mexicans celebrate their country's independence from Spain beginning on September 15th at 11 o'clock at night. From the balcony of the country's national palace, ringing the bell, the dago rang. The commemoration typically ends with three cries of, Viva Mexico! Viva Mexico! 
Viva Mexico! Above, a colorful swirl of tens of thousands of people crowded into the main plaza in central Mexico City. And that is the story of Cinco de Mayo. Any questions or comments? Uh, Your tour. Good night. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, take care. See you next month.